Welcome to the Physician's Financial Checkup Podcast. And today I am super excited to dive into the high stakes world of con contract negotiations with expert guidance from Ethan A. Nakama from the Rocky Mountain Physician Agency. Get ready because he's got some insider tips and strategies to help you to secure the highest compensation in terms that you deserve. So whether you're a seasoned pro or you're new to the game, this episode is imperative to listen to. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Physician's Financial Checkup Podcast, where we discuss the financial challenges and opportunities facing medical professionals. In this podcast, we'll discuss a variety of financial topics that are important to physicians, such as retirement planning, investing, and estate planning. We will also interview experts in the financial services industry to get their insights on these topics. If you're a physician or a spouse of a physician, I encourage you to listen to this podcast. We will provide you with the information you need to make sense down financial decisions and achieve your financial goals. Here's your host, Brent Bowden, a financial coach and certified financial planning advisor with over 15 years of experience helping medical professionals achieve their financial goals. To learn more about Brent Bowden and his services, visit brentbowden.com. Hello, I'd like to welcome our guest today, Ethan Nkama to the show. Thanks for joining us. Hey, happy to be here. Well, I appreciate it. I want to kind of jump right into uh, a little bit of your background. So you started the Rocky Mountain Physician Agency. And before we kind of get into that, I want to just hear about how you got to that point to start with. So tell me a little bit about your background. Uh, what were you doing before you started RMPA? So by way of background, I'm a lawyer by training, but I spent my entire career working in hospitals. So my initial goal professionally was to become a hospital CEO. I thought that by getting a law degree, my MBA. Lofty goals for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I definitely am a high achiever. And my mom is a doctor. And so I thought that was kind of my way to contribute to the, the medical industry, not being smart enough to be a doctor. And, you know, after about 15 years working in every area of a hospital from legal, strategy, finance, physician contracting, I got laid off. And I had a bit of an identity crisis. And that's what led me to start Rocky Mountain Physician Agency to advocate for doctors in contract negotiations with executives and employers. That's definitely something I get uh, asked a lot of questions about. And unfortunately, I don't have the background in that. Um, so love having your expertise on the show and appreciate that. So, so what was the kind of turning point that you thought, you know, this is something that isn't being done or, or not well enough or enough people know about out in the market that they can really uh, fuel their growth through contract negotiation? And what, what gets you up every day to be able to do that? My mom is really the inspiration for my business. And she told me early on when I started my firm that women doctors need special advocacy because there's challenges they face in the workplace that not everyone faces. And the thing that I have been most motivated by is supporting women physicians in contract negotiations. Because if you see the numbers that are publicly available, um, they show that women generalists make, you know, as much as, you know, 40 to 50,000, while specialists can make less than 100,000, uh, less than men in salaries. It's disgusting. And it motivates me and energizes me when I get to work with women doctors who say, We've had enough. We deserve better, and we're gonna we're gonna demand better. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so my wife is in a, a male dominated field. She's a civil engineer, so you know that comes up quite often, uh, and is certainly something that I, I know a lot of us are advocates for working for equal pay for for women and minorities as well. So uh, love what you're doing there. It, when did you start RPM or RMPA? So I got laid off in August of 2019, and right around that time, I started to have the idea 
but I wasn't ready to launch yet. So I got a job for about a year. And then as a <clears throat> the genius that I am in July of 2020, I thought that was somehow a smart decision to launch then and right in the middle of the pandemic. And it's been, uh, it'll be four years here in July. That's fantastic. And it sounds like you've had some pretty impressive growth over that time. It's the, one of the coolest things about the work that I get to do is it builds on itself. First, we make a doctor $50,000 above their salary. Then we make a doctor 100000 And then doctors start to talk about that. And then word gets around that other doctors want that as well. But really, the engine to our business is financial advisors. We work hand in hand with financial advisors who work with doctors and say, hey, we want our doctors to get a salary raise with their current employer or negotiate the best salary to start their start their career off on a strong foundation. Uh, so financial advisors really are key partners for our growth strategy. And, and the cool thing is we get to make them look like rock stars by helping their docs make a bunch more money. And then guess what happens? They got to go somewhere to invest and save that. That's awesome. Well, definitely talking to the, to the right crowd then. So give me a little bit of an overview of kind of what the current trends in physician compensation uh, and some of those kind of contract negotiation points, what, what's the market look like right, right now? You know, I think you'll see that each year there's incremental increases in physician compensation, but those increases far uh, are far delayed behind the growth in cost of living, um, inflation. And so doctors each each year that they sit on a contract without renegotiating it, they're taking a pay cut. And unfortunately, the way medicine works, it's like, if you don't, if a doctor doesn't speak up to make things better, it's gonna kind of, inertia is gonna rule the day. And the problem is going to exacerbate itself. So anytime I look at a Medscape report and it's like, hey, physician salaries went up 2% this year, cool, well, inflation is not is more than 2%. And my doctors haven't had a salary raise in six years. So that 2% is now compounded. So unfortunately, I think inertia with doctors tends to rule the day and they don't know or appreciate their options and they stay in crummy jobs and they're underpaid. Just like a lot of us probably, right? You, yeah, you don't, exactly. don't know. And so having an expert on your team is, is certainly helpful. So I will say, though, like I was with the plastic surgeons at University of Michigan today. I think so. I'm going to separate what you just said, like doctors don't know what they don't know, because that's a very like kind way to put it. I think doctors are bad at contract negotiation. And, and that's not a sales pitch for me. You don't have to work with me. But I think doctors are bad at it. And I think the Dunning-Kruger effect, it overinflates doctors' expectations and how good they are outside of this, the practice of medicine. And the, the way I validate that is how many doctors sign contracts without talking to an expert versus how many people try to do surgery on themselves or will try to repair some type of ailment. Well, you know, I saw a doctor do it on Grey's Anatomy once. Cool. You don't have any training in contract negotiation. Zero. Zilch. And the people that you're negotiating with are just like me. They have a ton of training. They're, they may have a law degree. They got MBAs for sure. Doctors are bad at contract negotiation, and they overinflate their how good they think they are, and it costs them hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, over the course of their careers. Yeah, so you make a good point. I tell clients this all the time: is you know, I, I don't work on cars. It's not what I know. It's not my specialty. Um, but you, you want help with your four hundred three B and making sure the allocation is correct. You know, those are the types of things that I've built the expertise in. Um, so I. I I think you're exactly right is, is knowing where you can push those buttons so actually what i wanted to, to ask you was what are some of those common pitfalls that you see uh when negotiating the contract i think the most common one that i see with i see this on a weekly basis probably multiple times is doctors signing contracts because they feel pressure from the employer as i was telling university of michigan this morning that pressure is completely artificial. 
when I was a hospital executive, when I sent a contract to a doctor, I needed that thing back because I knew my CEO was breathing down my neck to get that requisition filled. And even that was an arbitrary deadline. But yet doctors feel this intense pressure to capitulate when employers say, you need to sign this right away because they think it's going to get pulled. But the reality of it is the most frequent thing that I write for doctors for my clients is, hey, super excited about the offer. I just need a little more time to review. Thanks. And they always get it. But for, and here's my theory, my, my working hypothesis is because doctors spend their entire careers being told exactly what to do and how to do it, when they come out of training, they are completely blindsided by the opportunity they have to now advocate for themselves. And this is evidenced by some doctors even saying to me, I don't want to negotiate it because I don't want to burn a bridge or I don't want to. Uh, be set, look like I'm greedy and not un understanding that negotiating a contract is a basic part of accepting a contract. It's expected. Absolutely. So what would you say are some of those key components that every doctor should pay close attention to when they do that initial read through the contract? Yeah. So I, I have kind of what I patented as the big five and I, I contextualize that to, to mean if you gave me 15 minutes to look at a contract to figure out, is this good or bad, I would look at these five things. Now, are there many more things to be concerned about and worry about and, and put risk into your contract? Absolutely. But this is kind of my key areas where I think there's the most risk and the most value for doctors. First, their base salary and, and, and volume compensation. So. That's that big, sexy six-figure number that we all look for. But also, do you get any compensation for how many call shifts you take, for how many RBUs you have, relative value units, how many surgeries, patient visits, all of those things. Secondarily, the non-compete. In sports, when you complete your contract with your team and you're a you know, good, good player, you can then go wherever you want after the contract's over. In medicine, it works exactly the opposite where once you complete your contract, that's when your restriction begins. And so I wanna know what's in my doctor's non-competes or restrictive covenant. Secondarily, term and termination. How long is the contract and how do you get out of the contract? Bonus compensation, that's gonna talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, your signing bonus, your quality bonus, you know, that are you improving clinical metrics, outcomes, et cetera? Those can be big dollars. Uh, so always negotiate your signing bonus, quality bonus, other um, bonuses that are based on some action being taken or some goal being achieved. And then the last thing I want to know is what support is the employer providing my doctors towards student loan debt paid out? So typically that's commonly known as education loan debt assistance. And that is the amount. It can be as much as $100,000 over the course of a contract that employer is going to pay towards a doctor's student loan debt. That's awesome. Some, some good tips there. Uh, so do you find that physicians uh, can effectively negotiate? And obviously, it's going to depend on their role, but any type of work balance or flexibility in their, their contracts from a work perspective? Absolutely. Every doctor we work with, uh, one moment. <clears throat> Every doctor we work with, the very first thing that we do is sit down for what we call an intake interview. And that intake interview has a list of questions, some of which are helping prioritize what the doctor's values are as it relates to their practice and how do we accomplish those things in their contract. There's a list of seven things ranging from schedule, comp, uh, research you know, ability, all of those different things. And without fail, of the 75 doctors we've interviewed, they all have the same top three things. Now, these three things will vary in rank among doctors, but they're always the top three. My schedule, my free time, and fair pay. You're absolutely right. Doctors want to be whole people. And I think in 
our current generation, doctors are more aware of the fact that burnout is at an all time high for physicians. And physicians are going so far, they're so burnt out on their jobs that they're leaving, they're leaving medicine altogether. Mm -hmm. And I think doctors are doing a better job nowadays, uh, especially as they're coming out of residency and planning their practice. They're doing a better job of being mindful of how many clinic days do I have? How many patient contact hours are in my, in my uh, contract? How many surgical days do I have? And how do I, and then also the, the, on the greatest hits, the first, the first cut is the, the thing that doctors call me about most after their first contract is call. In yep. some shape or fashion, they are getting taken advantage of in terms of after hours clinical work. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, it is something that certainly through the pandemic, you know, the burnout has been a big issue. Your mental health has been a big issue. And so as those come more to light, I think especially for the physician side, you know, negotiating those in is a, is a big deal. What are some other creative incentives or benefits that you've been able to negotiate or that, that people sometimes ask for? Maybe it's not one of those normal ones you think about, but um, there are, you know, work environments out there that they'll cater to them. Yeah, that's a great question. I think what often gets overlooked, first and foremost, I mentioned this a moment ago, but education loan debt assistance. Mm -hmm. That is the money that your employer will pay directly towards your education loan debt. Just about every doctor I talk to has six figures of student loan debt. And getting your employer to help pay that off is a huge, huge benefit and gets you quicker to that doctor lifestyle that you've worked so hard for. Secondarily, we always talk about uh, how the support that you get in your practice. So many times what gets lost in the conversation about money and schedule is what's my support structure? What are my supplies? What's my equipment? And especially the more you specialize, you know, I work with some neurosurgeons that say, I need a very specific type of equipment for my work. So for for doctors making sure that you have the resources and support to um, to perform your job and, and take care of patients at the highest level possible. And you do that by having less friction in getting the things that you need for your day to day job. I often. I've, I've heard this idea that there might be contracts out there with signing bonuses. I've never seen one, but if that ever happens, like you've got to fix that right away. Like that should never happen uh, for any doctor. Um, and then I'd probably say one of the, the less common ones is in academics, you really need to be thinking less about money and more about your time. In academic uh, academic settings, you're typically a two-part physician. You're a part-time administrative physician and a part-time clinical physician. And a lot of times, the administrative responsibilities are not fully articulated. And so doctors get overwhelmed sometimes because they're trying to meet the clinical targets they have while there's this entire other part of their job that requires time, effort, energy. And they end up having to burn the candle at both ends, doing their charting at home, answering emails at home, all things that take away from their ability to provide care at the highest level, in my view. Yeah, I can definitely see from an academic standpoint is that work-life balance negotiation makes a big difference, knowing how many hours yeah. you're going to be spending on both sides of, of the fence there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very good point. So do you have any kind of resources or uh, support that you provide? positions throughout that negotiating process, you know, what do those look like? Yeah. So I, I would say for doctors who are going into negotiations, you know, let's talk about DIY. So if, if in my view, there's like, there's three, and this is not my, I didn't make this up. There's DIY, there's DFY, and there's do with you. Uh, so for me, I don't work with DIY doctors. So if a doctor says, I want to go do this on my own, like they're just not, going to be a fit for us. And so we'll talk about those docs. How can those docs go do it on their own? So what I see many doctors get wrong is they go to MGMA, Medical Group Management Association, or some other data source, or even worse, they talk to their colleague, and then they go ask for a salary raise based on that. 
hey, I noticed that MGMA says I should be making 40000 more, or Dr. Smith is making 40000 more. I saw that hundreds of times when I was a hospital executive, and zero times was that successful. For doctors who want to actually give themselves a chance of success to get a salary raise, the first thing they must do is pull their stats. Pull your clinical volume, pull your clinical quality stats for the last 12 months. Then you've got to go across the street or around town and get a job offer from any of your competitors. It doesn't matter. You got to get at least one that you'll be willing to accept. And then you can come back to your employer and have a conversation about, hey, I'd like a salary raise. Spoiler, they're going to say no first. They always do. Even when, I, when I'm in the room, they always say no first, right? So that's why you go get an offer because once they know you have an offer, their tone will change immediately. So don't waste your time like, well, I got this data and it says this. Or I talked to Dr. Jones. You're going to embarrass yourself. Go get a competing offer, knowing how busy you are and knowing your value to the organization. And once you have that, now they have to listen to you. And even better yet, lock arms with your fellow doctors and go in as a group of two, three, four, or more, and then see what happens. They can't stop you then. That's, that's a very good point. Well, those are some great tips for the DIYer. So talk a little bit about the next two. So the DFY and what was the done with yeah, you? So- DW. Yeah, so we we have the done with you and the and the done for you. So those are the doctors that we love, right? So the doctors who say, "All right, Ethan, this is a partnership. We're going to tag team this thing and let's climb this mountain together." And and we'll be your sherpa to the top of the mountain. The other approach is the the do for you who say, "Ethan, I have no knowledge in this, no interest in this, and no time for this. Can you take care of it?" So those are the doctors that we work with best. Uh, because similar to when I go to my doctor, I know who the expert is. But if I came in with a list of things that I found on Google that I needed her to debunk, like I, then do I really think she's the expert? So right. we don't work with DIYers. So for the other two, what we what we do is we do all of that for you. All of that and pulling your stats and analyzing how bi- – my job when I worked in hospitals was to quantify how much revenue doctors made for us down to the dollar. And I only worked in nonprofit faith-based institutions. Those hospitals, even today, those hospitals know how much doctors generate for them down to the dollar. And what doctors don't appreciate is that number's in the millions on an annual basis. It's in the millions. And so if doctors leave, that revenue leaves with them. So when I negotiate with on behalf of doctors, what we do first is we we pull your stats. We're going to fig- figure out how busy you are, how valuable you are to your hospital. The same way they're analyzing your value uh, for the business, we're going to do that to advocate for your value to other employers. Then you you go practice medicine. I'm going to go get offers for you. I'm going to go talk to the competitors that you're interested in potentially working for and go get you two to three offers. You're going to get wined and dined. They're going to say, hey, come work for us. Come work for us. We'll pay you this, give you all the support. And now, now what we'll do is we'll initiate the conversation with your employer. And I, I want to bring this up because I heard this this morning with the University of Michigan where a doctor said, well, you know, I can go into a negotiation. I'm aggressive. And that word aggressive is another reason that doctors are just bad at contract negotiation. It does not take being aggressive to win at a contract negotiation. It takes leverage. And so the reason you go in with the offer in hand and the reason I don't waste the doctor's time or my time talking to an employer without an offer is because I know what they're going to say. They're going to say no. And I'm not going to and I'm not going to go through that and lose a negotiation because I didn't anticipate the most likely outcome. So the next thing I say is. We totally understand that you feel like you can't pay Dr. Smith more. Just so you know, Dr. Smith has an offer down the road with your competitor for $50,000 more. And I know what you're going to say. She's under a non-compete. Just so you know, they've covered the non-compete penalty by paying her a signing bonus that's going to get paid off in three years. So what's your next move? So either you pay her or she's going to go. Simple as that. And in 95% of the cases, doctors end up staying where they are. 
And I assume this is also helps you build, you know, relationships with all the, the area hospitals, uh, in addition to a database of what each specialty, you know, the pushes and pulls can be for each specialty to know exactly how much they're willing to make that, obviously with the data behind it of, you know, how much work are they doing and, and uh, patients are they seeing, but you know, those little niches just keep adding onto each other. Exactly. That's fantastic. Well, you've shared a lot with us so far. Any success stories or examples that really stick out to you that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, there's one in particular of a group of women doctors who I I have so much admiration for. And I think they are the blueprint for how doctors can be successful in getting the value they deserve. So just a little bit of context these doctors got in contact with me because they worked for a large national for-profit health system that some people say you cannot negotiate against for some reason. And these doctors said, Ethan, we want to go private practice. We are beyond frustrated. We're all individual physicians who work in the same practice but we want to go private practice together because we really like working together and we cannot work for this practice anymore. I said, hold on. That's a really drastic move to go private practice. Because I, I can understand the implications of starting your own business. So I said, look, let me find you some offers. If you're willing to at least consider them, I can guarantee you that I can get you a salary raise and better support in your practice. That's exactly what I did. I went around town and I got them offers for six figures each, more than what they were making. But here's the thing. They didn't take it. They said no. The CEO for their current empl employer called me and said, Ethan, what number do we have to hit to make this go away? Each of those doctors got a salary raise, better support, more medical assistance, but on average, those doctors got a salary raise of $186,000 a year. And so you might say, well, what about my fee? My fee is a percentage of their pay, so it would be astronomical. I negotiate a bonus into their contract that covers my fee and the employer pays it. And my fee was less than half of that bonus. So not only do these doctors make almost $200,000 a year more to stay in the same exact city they already lived in, but they didn't have to pay a single dime out of their own pockets to do it. That's awesome. Well, I know uh, from just my experience in, in working with physicians that that contract negotiation experience is definitely something that you can't put a price tag on. So. The work that you do is, is phenomenal and certainly uh, moving our doctors forward is, is a great thing. So, Ethan, it has been a pleasure to, to talk to you today. Before we get off, though, I do want to give you an opportunity is how do people get in touch with you? How do they set up that kind of intake interview or, or early process to, to learn more about what they have and, and what RMPA offers? Yeah, great question, Brent. And I would say an important distinction for doctors to know about before you call me is we are not a law firm. We are talent agents for doctors. So when you call us, we're not going to click the, the clock and start charging you. We don't charge doctors to talk on the phone or ask questions. That's not what we're, that's not our payment model. And so you can find us on our socials, on Instagram, at Physician Agency, on LinkedIn with my first name and last name, and then also on our website at rmpa.co. That's Robert Mary Paul Adam.co. And, you know, I talk to so many doctors on a regular basis. Just call me, text me. Uh, you can find my phone number. It's, it's really not hard to find. But text me if you have questions about if you want to be a DIYer, I'll cheer you on from the stands. I don't believe that every doctor is a good fit for what we do. And we want to help the doctors who know that they need an expert Sherpa to get to the top of the mountain. Well, it's certainly been a pleasure talking with you. And we will link those uh, in the show notes. You can take a look at them. But Ethan, thanks for joining us today. And you have some amazing insights for contract negotiations for physicians. Yeah, thank you. The pleasure was all mine, Brent. Thanks, Ethan. If you're feeling overwhelmed by your finances, know that you're not alone. 
medical professionals face unique challenges when it comes to their financial well-being. I'm Brent Bowden, a certified financial planner with over 15 years of experience helping medical professionals achieve financial freedom. In my new book, The Physician's Financial Checkup, Financial Advice and Education for Medical Professionals, I share some proven strategies and expert insights to help you reduce your debt, manage your budget effectively, invest for long-term financial security, plan for comfortable and safe and secure retirement, navigate the complexities of medical practice ownership, estate planning, and more. So if you're a medical professional and want to be more confident about your finances, take control of your financial future and achieve peace of mind, then get your copy of the Physician's Financial Checkup today, available in paperback, ebook, and now even on audiobook. You can visit our website or your favorite bookstore to learn more. Don't wait. Start your journey to financial freedom today. Thank you for listening to the Physician Financial Checkup Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on your favorite platform and leave a review. You can also find more information on brentbowden.com. The information contained in this podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be construed as financial advice. The opinions expressed are solely those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the views of any other individual or organization. You should carefully consider your investment objectives, risk tolerance, and time horizon before making any investment decisions. If you are seeking financial advice, you should consult with a qualified financial advisor who can assess your individual circumstances and needs.